Hello everyone, welcome to this HLPF side event titled Paris minus the SDGs, a formula for inequality, insights on effective policy coherence in Kenya. My name is Zoha Shao and I'm a researcher at the Stockholm Environment Institute and very happy to have you all here on board. We have several panelists and speakers joining us today and I'll just introduce them all to you now. We have Ambassador Magnus Lennartsson, who is a Deputy Permanent Representative with the Permanent Mission of Sweden to the United Nations. We have Gabriela Iacobuta, who is a researcher with the German Development Institute, DIE. Uh, we have with us Philip Osano, who is the Acting Center Director for SEI's Africa Center. We've got Stephen Odiambo, who is a chief economist with the National Treasury and Planning in Kenya. And finally, we've got Ken Olu, who is the technical lead for SDGs with the Council of Governors in Kenya. So great to have you all on board. We have a pretty packed agenda um, for today. I will start with this welcome and introduction and afterwards hand over to uh, Ambassador Lennartsen to give some opening remarks. I will then present some of our key findings from this project and then hand over to Gabriella who will present some uh, insights on just transitions from three of our case studies in Germany, South Africa and the Philippines. Um, the rest of the event will then be a deep dive into Kenya given that Kenya is due to submit its VNR at this year's HLPF. Um, so we'll start with Philip Osano presenting some of our key findings from the Kenya case study. And then we'll have interventions from Stephen and Ken to give a Kenyan government perspective on some of these findings as well. And finally, we'll have the last 30 minutes saved for a discussion and Q&A. So I do encourage you to uh, publish and add any of your questions directly in the chat box and hopefully we'll be able to get to all of them. So I will now hand over to the ambassador for his opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't be on the um, on video image. Um, doing this through my through my telephone. Uh, so let me just start by thanking the Stockholm Environment Institute for the invitation to this interesting and timely event. The topics for discussion are very relevant to this year's high-level political forum, and they resonate with Sweden's key messages for HLPF this year. We are deeply concerned about the climate, but we also worry about growing inequality and exclusion. I would like to highlight uh, just two key issues from a Swedish perspective that are brought out also, I think, by the research presented by, uh, by SEI. And the first is that the NDCs and the SDGs need to be part of the same package. Translating the 2030 agenda into policy at the national level should always go hand in hand with implementing the Paris Agreement. These two historical multilateral framework agreements are interconnected and interdependent. The 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement were negotiated in parallel and adopted in 2015 within a few months of each other. The former is a voluntary agreement endorsed by world leaders. The latter is an agreement reached by the parties of the UNFCCC and a legally binding international treaty. SDG 13 on tackling climate change and its impacts make reference to the lead role of UNFCCC, but it also embeds action to tackle climate change firmly in the 2030 agenda itself. Likewise, there are multiple targets elsewhere in the SDGs which bear upon climate change mitigation, adaptation and resilience building. This reflects the recognition by UN negotiators at the time that many global goals from poverty eradication and ending hunger to conserving biodiversity and protecting our oceans will be unattainable if climate change is left unchecked. And also the recognition that going forward, actions to achieve social and economic objectives need to be aligned with climate change objectives. One of the biggest challenges facing governments in coming years is to reconcile policy agendas aimed at achieving and sustaining high standards of well-being of their people with the need to move swiftly and decisively to decarbonize their economies. At the same time, they will need to factor the necessity of climate change adaptation into future development plans. This is not easy, nor is it obvious, 
the pandemic has highlighted the need for policy coherence. And when we speak about building back better, we should be clear about the complementarity between the two agendas. Last month, the Swedish government presented a bill to parliament to accelerate action and delivery of the SDGs. We have set an overarching goal to achieve the 2030 agenda with an emphasis on policy coherence for sustainable development, which spans across different policy areas. We are weaving the SDGs into our national fabric. Sweden also aims to become the world's first fossil free welfare state, reaching net zero emissions by 2045 at the latest. My second point, we cannot lose sight of the goal of leaving no one behind. Leaving no one behind is both an overarching objective of the 2030 agenda and a prerequisite for achieving the 17 SDGs. Staying focused on this important objective will help reduce inequalities. We need smart and sensitive policies. While some climate policies could, if not properly designed, adversely impact the poor, climate policies can also be explicitly designed and targeted with a view to benefit the disadvantaged. So the importance of leaving no one behind, and of course, has come under sharp light by the pandemic, which clearly disproportionately affects people in vulnerable situations. As we stand on the cusp of the final decade of action to achieve the SDGs, and as we mobilize for an urgently needed, more ambitious climate action, we need to continue to pay close attention to a number of key issues. How would unmitigated climate change impact the prospects for achieving various sustainable development goals? How can actions to achieve one or more of the SDGs be designed to attain climate benefits simultaneously and cost effectively? How can actions to address climate change, whether mitigation or adaptation, advance progress towards other SDGs? How can the 2030 Agenda provide a framework also for climate policies and actions, which ensures that no one is left behind? And what lessons are we learning about the benefits and challenges of more closely aligning the implementation of these two agendas? How can we mitigate potential conflicts and create positive synergies? I hope and expect that the discussion today will bring us a little closer to the answers. I uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for those very insightful comments. I think you very rightly highlighted how the pandemic really reinforces the need to see climate change as a more holistic, in a more holistic manner as being more than just climate change, but related to inequality, development, health, education, jobs, and all of these different goals in a very cross-cutting way. So thank you very much. Really appreciate those comments. Um, I will now dive straight into our opening presentation, which will highlight some of the key findings from uh, this project on policy coherence that SEI and DIE and other organizations have been collaborating on. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. I just wanted to start by highlighting some of the other work that is already being done on SEI, which looks at synergies and conflicts between climate and development goals, as well as policy coherence more broadly. For example, we have an initiative on integrated climate and development planning, which takes a quantitative perspective for assessing policy coherence. We have NDC SCG Connections, which is um, an online tool that was jointly developed by SEI and DIE and essentially visualizes the content of the NDCs from an SDG perspective. And we have SDG Synergies, which again is an online interactive tool which is used to score how the extent of progress on one SDG target affects progress on the other SDG target to come up with this matrix. And they've just recently launched this website which provides further information about the tool. So I do encourage you to please look into that as well. Next slide, please. So diving straight into this project, which essentially aimed to assess policy coherence and take all of these different tools and things further to look at policy coherence between Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement, specifically at the national level and have a more national perspective. 
And the rationale for this really was that the goals of the Paris Agreement interact both positively and negatively with the SDGs and progress on the NDCs and climate goals can either help or hinder progress on the SDGs. So we've theorized that policy coherence efforts through which countries jointly implement these two agendas um, would help promote synergies and mitigate or address conflicts um, on the ground nationally. So in terms of methodology, we had six country case studies, Germany, Kenya, South Africa, Sri Lanka, Sweden, and the Philippines, um, and they were chosen along the matrix of level of income and domestic dependence on fossil fuels. And essentially, as part of this project, we reviewed their policies and documents rela relating to climate change and the SDGs, for example, their uh, national adaptation plans, their climate change policies, their NDCs, and um, their VNRs. And we also conducted a literature review of other academic papers relating to these countries um, that already looked at synergies and conflict between climate and development goals. And we also conducted a number of semi-structured interviews um, with different stakeholders in each of these countries. And next slide, please. So our key finding here really is that inequality trade-offs are prominent in cases of incoherence. So in cases where policy incoherence is present, we find that inequality is an SDG that, that is particularly compromised. Um, and this figure is quite complex and difficult to understand, so I'm not going to talk you through the whole thing, but really it's meant to demonstrate the complexity of interactions between SDGs and, and the climate agenda in these different countries and show how cross-cutting these goals really are when we're talking about synergies and conflicts. And what we've tried to do here in the second half of the figure is come up with these key issue areas within which these goals interact in the form of synergies or conflicts. So for example, we have the food, energy, water, land nexus, which um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with, but basically talks about how um, water availability for hydropower, for example, might uh, conflict with water usage for other sources, such as drinking water or food security. And similarly, there might be land competition between land for growing food versus land for biofuels, for example. Um, so climate policies can therefore um, conflict with these overarching development agendas as well. Um, but most importantly, uh, the remaining three issue areas around economic growth paradigm, the urban rural divide, and just energy transitions really show how inequality itself appears in different guises or in different forms in the different countries that we considered. So for example, in Sri Lanka and Kenya, we found that policies to promote economic growth um, were at the heart of the country's development strategies, um, but often was conflicting with climate change agendas um, due to, you know, fossil fuel based development, uh, as well as, you know, exacerbating inequalities and poverty on the ground because this trickle down economics effect didn't necessarily always work. In Sweden, we had this issue of urban-rural divide where climate policies that imposed fuel taxes disproportionately affected rural populations that were more car dependent and were also had lower income. And in Germany, South Africa, and the Philippines, we, had, we saw this idea of just energy transitions because um, certain climate policies would disproportionately affect coal dependent regions, which were also employed more marginalized proportions of the population as well and my colleague Gabriella will kind of talk about that a little bit more later on. So this really showed how inequality is at the heart of a lot of these conflicts between climate policies and development policies more broadly. If you could go to the next slide. Another key finding that we came across out of these country case studies is that barriers to policy coherence are essentially political in nature. For example, we do have some institutional barriers related to institutional fragmentation in Sri Lanka, for example, or development plans not being aligned with climate agendas in some countries, or, you know, a lack of broader stakeholder involvement in the implementation of these two agendas. But then you also have some barriers relating to the ideas that different actors hold in terms of their values and worldviews and how they perceive these two agendas, right? So, in Sri Lanka, as I already mentioned, we had this overarching economic growth paradigm leading to inequality conflicts on the ground. In Germany, we found that 
employment in coal producing regions was really seen as a source of identity and social cohesion um, for the sector, for the population that was employed in that sector. Um, so, you know, mitigating these conflicts made it more challenging. Um, and in South Africa, we had this issue of vested interests where a disproportionate power was held by um, fossil fuel corporations, um, which again led to conflicts on the ground. So all of this really demonstrates the inherently political nature of policy coherence. And going back to inequality raises these questions of for whom are we implementing policy coherence measures? Who does it benefit? Who wins and who loses from these efforts? And how do we consider and take into account inequality when we're really implementing these two agendas on the ground as well? Next slide, please. As part of this work, we also try to identify some strategies, very preliminary strategies or recommendations for facilitating increased policy coherence going forward. Um, and some of the kind of somewhat obvious recommendations that come out of it is that we need to take a whole of government approach where all different levels and departments within government need to share the responsibility of implementing um, the 2030 agenda and the Paris Agreement as well to overcome accountability concerns. We need to have kind of greater coordination and interaction between different governmental bodies and non-governmental bodies when implementing goals. Um, and this idea of mainstreaming climate and development goals into overarching development plans and climate plans, as well as budgeting of the country overall. Um, furthermore, this idea of tracking progress on the alignment of climate and SDGs through monitoring, reporting and evaluation. And we can discuss how the VNRs might be a useful tool to do that. Um, However, we do need further research on how to navigate some of these political barriers to coherence, since a lot of these recommendations really relate more to the institutional factors. And there hasn't really been much work done yet on how these political factors can really be overcome. Um, and that also raises the question on about, you know, whether they really need to be overcome. So whether we can achieve climate and development goals um, without policy coherence, for example, especially in countries where incoherence might be a natural state um, and you know again raises the, this question of for whom are we implementing these goals who do they benefit and in whose favor are we mitigating conflicts to begin with at all um, yeah so i guess i will leave it there if you can go to the next slide yeah, so thank you. Um, there's a link there which um, is to our policy brief, which kind of elaborates and summarizes these findings a bit more as well. So I encourage you to read that further. And I will now hand over to Gabriella, who will present on just transitions in three of our country case studies. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, uh, Zoha, for the in earlier introduction and for the invitation. My name is Gabriela Jakobutza. I'm a researcher at the German Development Institute, and I will present to you uh, the findings of the three case studies that were under the responsibility of the German Development Institute in the Overcoming Incoherence uh, Joint Project with SEI and Link Shopping University. Uh, the three countries are Germany, South Africa, and the Philippines. The research team um, at DIE was formed by uh, from, of, like myself, uh, Ramona Hegele and Sander Chan. And as we were looking at how these three countries are uh, addressing uh, Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement, we found um, the theme of just transition as uh, a common topic, as a synergic solution seen by all of these countries. Uh, next, please. So we chose these three countries uh, due to their very different social, economic, political and environmental backgrounds. And as we look into um, how the two agendas are addressed, uh, the context of the country is quite important. So for the three countries, uh, um, the economic gr um, groups were different. So Germany is a high income country, South Africa, upper middle income countries and the Philippines, low middle income countries. Also, they have different GDP growth rates from a very low growth rate of South Africa Africa to um, the Philippines, which has the highest growth rate in the region at the moment. As Zoha has mentioned, inequality is extremely important in, in that sense. And um, here also, for instance, we have South Africa, uh, which is one of the countries with the highest um, inequality at the moment, and also uh, still a high poverty headcount ratio, uh, although it has made a great progress there. 
state capacity of course is very important when it comes to the implementation of the two agendas um, and here based on a world uh, uh, world bank uh, governance indicator we see that there's also a high difference on uh, between the countries on a scale from minus 2.5 to 2.5 the countries are also um, addressing climate change at the moment to a different extent unfortunately germany and south africa are both um, actually uh, having highly insufficient climate action uh, and they are not meeting the two degree um, uh, temperature increase of the Paris Agreement, only uh, the Philippines does. In terms of the SDG index, um, Germany is a front runner in implementing the SDGs, uh, while um, the other two countries still have quite some work to do. Next, please. So I will jump straight into Germany. Uh, the issue we um, that that um, uh, was perhaps most important in Germany was the coal phase out. Um, I said that earlier that Germany is a front runner in terms of SDG implementation, but it is still struggling on its environmental SDGs. And one of them is uh, the climate SDG. It has the highest um, levels of greenhouse gas emissions in Europe and also is one of the top countries in the world. Um, uh, however, um, it has around 80,000 coal-related jobs condensed in a few regions, um, and uh, the electricity sector is one of the key sectors for addressing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, so it really has to tackle this part. Uh, what Germany has uh, done recently is that it has formed a coal commission, which is an, um, a very inclusive, a very inclusive body of uh, around 28 actors from um, uh, academia, uh, civil society, businesses, uh, the different states, municipalities, uh, the regions uh, and the communities that will be affected. And this coal commission was tasked with coming um, up with a strategy to phase out coal, and uh, they have put this strategy forward for phasing out coal by 2038 uh, to be reviewed later on. This involves compensation, training and support for workers, uh, also compensation for private and industrial energy users if prices will increase, um, as well as putting forward very concrete projects and strategies for um, the, the regions that will be affected in order to undergo structural transformation. And this also involves uh, renewable expansion, for instance. So for this project, they wanted to ensure environmental compatibility, security of supply, economic efficiency, energy and infrastructure, planning and legal certainty. However, um, 2038 is a bit late. Uh, Germany should phase out uh, coal already by 2030, according to uh, literature, in order to be in line with the Paris Agreement is also a long uh, time, so it has to ensure very clear, responsible people and also have uh, legal frameworks in place to ensure that political changes will not lead to um, uh, uh, blockage of the uh, plan. Uh, next, please. And South Africa has a similar situation. Um, it also has to phase out coal. It also has around 80,000 coal jobs concentrated in a few regions. Moreover, 30% of uh, its coals go to exports, which actually um, also pose some uh, insecurity to the economy due to volatility in demand and prices. Uh, however, South Africa is also dealing with high poverty and inequality still, and also especially a very high unemployment rates of up to 80%, especially among youth in some of the regions. Um, one uh, of the things that Af uh, South Africa has done was to introduce a carbon tax. Um, this has been a very long process, but it's uh, sending a very clear signal. However, to protect some of the energy uh, producers and consumers, uh, around 95% of the emissions are now under exemption until from the tax until 2022, and the tax is rather low. To uh, ensure that the communities uh, are benefiting, it also enacted the Renewable Energy Independent uh, Power Procurement Program, uh, which uh, has investments in renewables and tries to ensure benefits to the community. So this project has to ensure that some of the, the jobs uh, are of 
offer to uh, people in the community, that some of the revenue goes to the community, uh, and that the community can also be a shareholder. Um, it also has done some uh, spatial planning in order to identify uh, areas of high economic potential and social needs uh, where it could start investing in renewable manufacturing, again, um, supporting these communities. It also has now an inclusive dialogue on pathways for uh, just transition, where it includes uh, actors from the trade unions, the businesses, um, uh, and uh, civil society and uh, yeah, policy makers uh, to um, uh, design better policies. Um, it's not yet clear exactly how this will be taken into account. However, the communities are not fully uh, involved. One of the challenges in South Africa is that there is still quite strong lobby. Um, uh, ESCOM is the, the biggest power producer and uh, is mostly invested uh, in, in fossil fuels. And uh, together with SASOL, they cover around 50% uh, of total emissions in South Africa. So just two um, uh, producers, basically. Um, there are limited community benefits. There's poor infrastructure. And quite importantly, there's a lack of policy coherence between the different governance levels, um, but also across the sectors, but also between um, uh, the, the state and municipalities and so on. Next slide, please. Um, in the Philippines, uh, basically we, we looked at uh, green jobs as uh, a part of the just energy transition. Uh, the, the Philippines is a quite different country in, in that sense. Uh, it's currently uh, struggling with energy access due to a very high, a very large number of islands, which also leads to spatial inequalities. Um, these islands cannot always be uh, be reached by infrastructure, and there's uh, at the same time a, a huge increase in energy demand. Um, it also wants to ensure inclusive growth um, and yeah, to address the infrastructure need. However, there has been a decrease in the share of renewables since 1990, uh, in particular because coal and, and gas have come uh, strongly in there. Um, and still, the electricity sector is a, a key sector for greenhouse gas emission reductions. What uh, the Philippines has done has been to enact the Green Jobs Act, uh, which also aims to provide training programs, but also incentives um, um, in, uh, such as tax deductions uh, and, and others for businesses who um, uh, create uh, uh, green jobs uh, or who bring in uh, equipment and also social protection for lost jobs. There's also a tax reform for acceleration and inclusion. Um, sorry if there's a background noise. <laughs> Uh, there's also a, a tax reform for acceleration and inclusion, um, which basically puts a, a tax on coal and there are also fit-in tariffs for renewables, this in addition to, to support renewables further. It also has the national spatial strategy where it identifies infrastructure gaps and ensures um, uh, more resilience to climate change in that sense. It has already produced around 200 thousand decent jobs in the renewable energy sector. So in that sense, one could say that um, um, the, the process is working, but still there, there are huge issues um, in implementation and uh, it's really limited at the moment in part due to lack of political support and the current regime has made it quite clear that uh, climate and the SDGs, especially on the environmental side, are not really priority. Um, also, as a conflicting policy, it has a coal roadmap, which um, um, implies the, the, an additional 10 gigawatts uh, of coal capacity by 2025. It also has infrastructure and technical uh, knowledge issues. So next and last slide. Thank you. So. Yeah, to conclude, there are challenges and opportunities in implementing the two agendas. Uh, an incoherent implementation of the two agendas can pose um, uh, huge problems such as job losses, uh, regional and social and economic impacts as well. Uh, on the other hand, just transition uh, can bring about multiple benefits to Agenda 2030, such as um, environmental protection, green growth and green jobs, health, air and water quality, clean and reliable energy, inequalities uh, and poverty reduction, as well as greener human settlements. So addressing a really large number of SDGs. 
However, the country context is very important and the extent to which uh, the synergic solutions can be applied really depends on that. So implementation is an issue and political and public support, legal enforcement and state capacity are key there. Um, they do need to clearly define coordinating implementation responsibility bodies, then ensuring policy coherence both vertically and horizontally, so both um, sectorally and uh, across different governance levels and different actors. And uh, inclusive policy design and implementation approaches is very important to understand um, where the problems can occur and how to address them to limit um, the impact on inequality. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Gabriel. Gabriel. Really enjoyed really that fun. presentation and I think um, the pandemic now especially highlights the need for a just energy transition as we see the repercussions occurring as people lose their jobs. So I think it's a very timely discussion to have right now. Um, I will now hand over to Philip Osano from SEI's Africa office who will present on the Kenya case study. Are you with us, Philip? We cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Uh, I was just saying what I'm presenting is that as part of this uh, wider study, what uh, we did uh, for the case of Kenya, also looking at policy coherence for, for Kenya. Next slide, please. So just by background, just in terms of the introduction that was uh, presented, the methodology that we followed in this study actually involved sort of three steps. One was to look at the national policies across the board, the policies that speak to development more broadly um, and across the relevant sectors. And of course, also to do uh, mapping of the institutions that have different responsibilities for both climate change action implementation and the different uh, you, you different SDG goals, um, and also to look at what is happening both from the peer reviewed literature, but also with great literature. And that critical component was actually to conduct key informal interviews. So the table that you see uh, in the slide shows the different categories of stakeholders that we interviewed. Kenya has a devolved system of governance, so we have a national government, and then we have uh, 47 Subnational governments. Uh, we also did conduct interviews with civil society groups and the international development partners, particularly UNDP. Next slide, please. So, just to give you a, an institutional framework for how climate change is dealt with in Kenya, we do have a National Climate uh, Change Act, which was enacted in 2016, and it specifies clearly how climate change uh, is instant, is institutionalized within the government. So at the highest level, there's a climate change uh, council, which is actually chaired by the president. Uh, and under the climate change council, there's a climate change secretariat, which coordinates the implementation of different climate change action. Um, and within the climate change, um, um, within the government, all the government departments across the different uh, ministries and departments have a climate change uh, unit that are responsible for climate change. Um, the national parliament is responsible for issues of legislation, including developing subsidiary uh, legislation for different components of climate change. And then you have a, a monitoring and compliance unit within the National Environment Management Authority. And within the default system of governance, and, and uh, our colleague Ken will present that, we have a council of governors which coordinates all the subnational governments in terms of their climate action. And at the same time, all the subnational governments also have climate change actions within their respective um, uh, program of implementation. Um, because we are looking at synergies and trade off between SDGs, please just go to the next slide. Yeah, so we are looking at synergies and trade off between SDGs. So institutionally, just to help you understand how the climate change is mainstream in development planning, the Sustainable Development Goals is implemented, is domesticated in Kenya under what is called Vision Kenya Vision 2030, which is the national 
action plan program for development. And that action plan is anchored within a green economy strategy, which is a strategy that helps to provide a roadmap for the country to have a low carbon development pathway. Um, and, and the action, the, the climate change actions are therefore integrated within the development planning framework at the national level. The vision 2030 is implemented in five year cycles. So at the moment we are in what we call media, medium term three, medium term planning three and TP3 2018-2022. And that is corresponding with the National Climate Change Action Plan for 2018-2022. So you would see that um, that's how climate change is integrated into the development planning framework to make sure that climate change actions are included into the, all the sectors of development. And then, of course, that then also happens at the county level, at the sub-national level, where, where the, the uh, Vision 2030 um, is implemented by the county government under what is called uh, CIDP, Comprehensive International Development Plans. And those also include climate change actions for each of them. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, in terms of what we looked at, uh, uh, how the government has tried to localize and institutionalize SDGs, uh, the government, of course, um, does uh, reports. One of the key reports that um, helped set up the SDG doc localization was the end of uh, NDG end term report. Um, and then in 2016, the government um, designated the State Department of Planning, uh, which uh, Mr. Obiambo is, uh, is part of to be the coordinating agency of SDG execution in, in the country. And, and the department developed a roadmap to guide how SDGs would be implemented. Now, one of the things that uh, I need to highlight here is that um, Kenya participated in the first voluntary national report in 2017. Uh, and every two years, the country developed a progress report on SDGs. And for this year, 2020, Kenya is uh, participating in the second, uh, presenting the second voluntary national report. I think one of the key issues that we found out that is a major challenge is uh, availability of data. And of course, we'll go to discuss this, but that's one of the issues that is really uh, coming out as a barrier to us understanding what is happening. In terms of the synergies and trade off, we looked at what is presented in the Vision 2030 medium term plan uh, for the period 2018 to 2022, and what are the emissions reduction targets as presented in the Kenya's NDC. And I would only concentrate on the trade-off because the synergies, if you look at the table that is uh, presented, you'd see that the green uh, boxes highlighted in green speaks to where we have positive interactions, which means that uh, we have synergies in actions on the SDG side and the climate mitigation side. But the, the boxes, the two boxes which have got um, orange are where we actually have conflict. So, one area where we have conflict, of course, uh, sorry, just go back. Um, the previous slide, yeah, thank you. So energy security, um, the efforts to increase energy security uh, partly also depends on continued use of, of coal um, and oil. So that is uh, being problematic. And the other area is the focus on industry because industries, of course, uh, are still using some oil technologies so that's leading to pollution, and pollution, of course, means that uh, it's also creating um, um, increasing emissions. Next slide, please. When we looked at uh, clusters of what is all presented in terms of the food, water, energy, and land access, and, and the economic growth in terms of inequality, I think two areas that come out with challenges are the need to increase agricultural productivity, uh, because that is uh, creating conflict with um, deforestation as communities are moving into marginal areas and, 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 uh, and deforesting land. And the other area is actually also the challenge of balancing water use to be able to allocate water for irrigation, but at the same time have water to put other priorities, including hydropower generation, as well as for industrial and domestic consumption. Next. So in terms of the governance challenges, uh, we identified quite a few. I'm just going to highlight two here. One is capacity. Uh, there's quite a, a, a big challenge with capacities. Uh, and I note in the, in, the, in the current voluntary report that the government has presented that 
uh, that's now being addressed through a training program under the Kenya School of Government. But the other thing which speaks to the issues of ideas that Zaha presented is the challenge of using uh, GDP as an indicator for economic growth and human welfare. Because in instances where, for example, we have deforestation uh, being done by communities because they depend on fuel, for example, or because of timber um, production, uh, that actually does not um, uh, is, is a process that contributes to economic um, economic development and economic growth, but actually is slowing down on natural capital. So we find many of these areas where the use of GDP as as an indicator presents a challenge because it does not project what the real issues around natural capital deterioration is. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of strategies for increased coherence, um, one of the issues we talked about is capacity, but there's also a need for institutional coordination. I think the institutional framework is quite robust enough in terms of creating mechanisms for coordination, but in practice is still a challenge because of budgeting as well as other constraints around, um, around capacity. And of course, uh, research and knowledge generations to understand much more better the, the, this current of interactions and interlinkages is still is still needed. Next slide. Yeah, so that's that's in a nutshell what uh, we found out from the Kenyan case study, and I look forward to the discussions um, on the ground. Thank you very much, Philip. I think, yeah, especially the challenges that you highlighted relating to capacity and GDP as an indicator are particularly prominent and something that we should think about further. And I think once again, the pandemic has really shown has shown a light on this idea of GDP as an indicator of well-being as we shut down our economies and try to prioritize human life over economic growth. Will we continue along that trend or will we go back to kind of endless economic growth and consumption? So thanks for raising those issues. We'll now get into some interventions from the Kenyan government to explore some of these issues further. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see that we had posed these before that, sorry, we had posed these four questions um, that we wanted interventions on to discuss a bit further. The first was around how these synergies and conflicts that have been presented are actually being taken into consideration in terms of SDG implementation on the ground in Kenya. Um, secondly, we were talking about the latest BNR and how we see progress on the SDGs define and relate to these synergies and conflicts. And then thirdly, around this issue of inequality and how we think it can be mitigated in relation to SDG implementation. Um, and finally, what strategies going forward are most important in promoting policy coherence between these two agendas for Kenya on the ground um, and really goes back to these barriers and challenges. How can we mitigate some of them and what is really needed to mitigate them? So I will now hand over to Stephen for his um, intervention and thoughts on some of these questions. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, my photo is there. And the reason why I put my photo is that my computer always asks me whether I'm a robot. So every time I present something, I put my photo there to confirm that I'm not a robot. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for inviting us. I think this is uh, almost the third or fourth time the Stra or Stockholm Environmental Institute is working with me, so I'm really blessed. And I want just to thank Ian, I want to thank uh, Zoha, and I want to thank also my host here, Philip and Casalde. We have worked very well. Now, I've looked at those four questions and I'll not respond to them. The reason is that if you listen to Philip very carefully, when he was presenting for Kenya, he has answered all the four questions. So from where I am, I'll just go into my brief insight into what we wanted to, some kind of reaction on what Philip has raised, but looking at it from the national policy perspective. Next slide, please. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what I've done is that uh, I changed the heading of this discussion. I was very perturbed to see Paris minus the SDGs. So in my very final document that I'll share with you, I've said the heading should be Paris plus the SDGs agenda 
a formula for ending inequality. And the reason why I'm saying this is that if you move, remove SDGs from Paris agreement, then we collapse. And the reason why I'm saying this is that in Kenya, we recognize the importance of the environmental sector as a key to the realization of both the Kenya Vision 2030 and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. That one we recognize very highly. And the reason why we are saying this is that in Kenya, we also appreciate and acknowledge that climate change issues can lead to what we call multi-layered crises, which are very likely to compromise our Kenya's development aspirations and the overall national development agenda. And therefore, moving forward, we have to treat the Paris Agreement and the SDGs uh, together, because these two are together and the ambassador raised that issue very well, that we cannot afford to treat Paris Agreement and the SDGs separately. These are two ideas that are mutually beneficial and they rely on each other to guide the socioeconomic and environmental development of this country. So that is very important. Just move to the next slide. Now, we are also saying that in Kenya, it's very important to note that uh, for very many years, this country has been do doing something. We have specific policies, legislations, key interventions and policy measures that the government of Kenya has been putting in place and that the government has deployed to guide on the environmental development agenda. And what is important is that uh, for Kenya, this integrates the SDGs. If you look at what Philip was doing, that if you look at our national environmental development uh, agenda, it, it incorporates or aligns to the NDCs. NDCs are part of our national environmental development agenda. So it is very important that the government has been doing something. But moving forward, I think we are just thinking about how can we improve what we have been doing? How can we go around some of these policy incoherences that Philip raised? And how can we make sure that as we implement the SDGs, we take into account the issues that were raised in the Paris Agreement? Next slide, please. So ladies and gentlemen, moving forward, what we are saying is that uh, from the macroeconomic policy analysis and management, it is very clear in Kenya that there are clear policy imperatives that need to be addressed in order to facilitate the implementation of the SDGs. And from where I sit as the chief economist, the most important and urgent thing to do is that we need to overcome what we call the policy coherence challenges for sustainable development. Those issues that Philip was raising, we need to overcome those. We are aware of that because of the politics and other issues, inherent issues for development, naturally there would be those challenges. But what we are saying, ladies and gentlemen, is that we need to adopt policies that co-create what we call the co-benefits of sustainable development in the context of climate change. In order to overcome the challenges we are facing or the in policy incoherences, we need to create co-benefits of sustainable development in the context of climate change. We need also to carefully understand and maneuver and have proper navigation of SDG implementation during the issues of climate change. That moving forward, we must do that. That as we implement other issues to achieve the SDGs, we must take into account how we maneuver around the whole issues of 
climate change. Just next slide again. So I was saying that we need to try and ask a few questions. But the most important question is how do we promote socioeconomic elevation? Or how do we build poverty free egalitarian societies and communities? while at the same time adopting effective sustainable development approaches or measures to contribute to positive climate actions. I think these are what I'm calling the pedagogical questions of development. And if we address the issue of Paris minus the SDGs, I think to be able to turn around these and make sure that we move the both agendas together, this is what we need to do that we must promote socioeconomic elevation. And that is by trying to create what we call poverty-free egalitarian societies. And remember what the ambassador said, that we cannot afford to delink the issues of environment and also inequalities. But moving forward, I think what we need to do is then, we need measures that contribute to positive climate actions. We need to reduce adversities of climate change and help build capacities of communities and societies to be climate resilient. And that's what we are trying to do in Kenya, that as we address issues of development, we also try to address issues of climate resilience, particularly among the arid and semi-arid areas where we are prone to major issues of climate change. But moving forward, the second question then we are saying in Kenya is, how do we reduce socioeconomic disparities? And I think when the high level political forum started on Monday, the issue of building back better was raised. Then how can we contextualize what we are doing by creating policy balances and addressing the policy coherence issues with the intention of minimizing the trade-offs and maximizing synergies between climate, energy, and poverty, food security nexus. I think this is a major issue. And if you look at what Philip, the table that he presented there to show the, the trade-offs and the, you could see that, that while you try to achieve some SDGs, you also sometimes get some trade-offs which interfere. So finally, ladies and gentlemen, then move to the next slide, Ian. These are three important issues that I wanted us to think about. And as I finish my contribution, I think for us in Kenya, and I would advise that for the rest of the world, if you have to address this topic properly, there are a few intellectual summary issues. There's nothing intellectual about what I'm going to say. But these are my considerations that moving forward, we need to have climate adopt adaptation strategies that help build strong communities and climate resilient. But what is most important is that they must also promote inclusive socioeconomic growth and development, while at the same time taking care of the adverse effects of the climate change. That is very important. Secondly, that as we think about these issues, then we need to put together. We need to have more emphasis on co-benefit approaches. In Kenya, what we are saying is that Kenya's policy agenda must seek to recognize the comprehensive co-benefit approaches where we intersect the vulnerabilities of climate change and the requirement for sustainable development. I think moving forward, that must be emphasized. And finally, we are also saying that we need to prioritize socioeconomic development strategies to be able to yield greater climatic benefits without compromising on national and county development imperatives. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I think this is my reaction. Everything that could have been said was summarized by Philip. And I just thought, as the chief economist, these were the issues, that, the, the kind of interventions that I wanted just to improve on what has been done. Thank you and may God bless each one of you. Thank you, Stephen. Really, really interesting remarks. And I think 
like this idea of co-benefits, I think, is a critical and the heart of a lot of these issues that we're talking about. And I think especially because we often talk about climate mitigation as a threat to development, but you know it can be an opportunity at the same time. And we can talk about climate adaptation, especially as an opportunity to promote development as well. So thank you for raising that. I will now hand over to Ken Olo from the Council of Governors for his uh, intervention. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon or good morning. Uh, hello participants. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity just to also share my uh, submission. Uh, Kenya has a devolved system of government uh, which comprises of the national and the 47 uh, county governments and uh, this devolved system of government is currently seven years old. And uh, the county governments have uh, a key delivery role in implementing uh, SDGs and uh, as well as delivery of uh, climate change and uh, of course uh, uh, the nationally determined uh, contribution. This is because the devolved governments uh, have uh, jurisdiction over sectors relevant for climate change such as agriculture, soil, water conservation, forestry, uh, water and sanitation, county transport and health. So those are very, uh, I mean, climate uh, uh, sensitive uh, sectors. Uh, the principle of sustainable development uh, are virtually the same as those that Kenya has adopted. As mentioned in earlier presentation, Kenya has a, a long term blueprint we call the Vision 2030, uh, which we implement through our five year midterm plans at the national government. And this is as well done at the county government through a five year rolling plan called, uh, called the County Integrated Development Plans. And uh, the Vision 2030, for example, uh, recognizes that the Kenya economy is based on sectors which are highly susceptible to, to the impact of climate change. Uh, for example, uh, the agriculture sector, uh, which is almost 98% rain fed in Kenya. So right from the Kenya, the highest planning uh, blueprint, Kenya already recognizes uh, the need for paying special attention uh, to climate change. Uh, the county government, on the other hand, have, um, uh, have a responsibility of uh, mainstreaming or uh, cascading down the national uh, uh, planning uh, blueprints. And uh, already the county governments have been able to mainstream the sustainable development goals as well as uh, the climate uh, climate change in their county integrated development plans, effectively rolling, rolling out the implementation process uh, through the departmental strategies, uh, annual development plans and budgets. So uh, much of this was well captured in the presentation uh, from, from Philip. Uh, but of course, uh, for climate change in Kenya, the key legislation that is guiding uh, both the national and the county government is the Climate Change Act 2016, which sets the legal basis for mainstreaming climate change considerations and actions uh, into sector functions and providing legal foundation for the National Climate Change Action Plan. So currently we are implementing the second uh, National Climate Change Action Plan, uh, which is aligned to our planning. So it's running for 2018-2022. And um, uh, as a way of uh, engaging county governments, we are currently, uh, the county governments are now developing county level uh, climate change action plans. Uh, this is to ensure that counties uh, take responsibility also at the lower level. And in doing this, uh, county governments have uh, developed uh, coordination frameworks by designating a county minister responsible for climate change. Uh, this has been done as well for SDGs. So each county government has what you are calling the county SDGs champion to uh, support uh, mainstreaming of SDGs. But at the same time, you also have county designated CEC, what you are calling county executive committee member for climate change. So these two structures at the county level ensure that the synergy between both uh, in implementation of both climate change and, and SDGs. And uh, we've in trying uh, to, 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 to uh, cascade the national policies, we have the National Climate Change uh, Fund uh, regulation, 
And already seven counties have developed county level climate change fund regulation requiring allocation of up to 3% of their annual budgets to address climate change. Uh, and this has only been possible because uh, Kenya has an array of national uh, legal and policy frameworks for climate change uh, that is anchoring the implementation of NDCs at the national level. And the, at the county level, this is now being uh, brought down to the county level so that counties can develop what you're calling county uh, determined uh, contributions so that they feed into the national uh, commitments uh, uh, in, in, in broad base so that all the counties take a bit of the responsibility and then feeding into the national commitment. So climate change has been uh, mainstreamed in uh, planning at both level. And uh, just to highlight some of the uh, key issues that have arisen in the past regarding uh, synergies and cross across the priorities of uh, various sectors. Uh, there's a study that uh, was done by Ministry of Environment and Forestry, uh, uh, looking at the impacts of the uh, assessment, assessing the impact uh, of the National Climate Change Action Plan 2018-2022, mitigation and adaptation actions on SDGs and the big four agenda which is currently uh, the government uh, uh, four priorities of development, that is uh, food security, uh, trade and manufacturing, uh, affordable housing, as well as health. And uh, this study yielded quite interesting uh, results because uh, it brought out the need and emphasized the need for uh, uh, building uh, uh, synergies between the SDGs and the Paris Agreement uh, because uh, uh, the assessment uh, looked at the impact of all climate actions on uh, SDG 1, that is on poverty eradication, SDG 5 on gender equality, and SDG 10 on reducing inequality. And the analysis actually reveals that the implementation of the National Climate Change Action Plan can provide an instrument for contribution to the attainment of the Big Four Agenda and contribute to the achievement of food security and nutrition for all Kenyans by the year 22. Uh, it also identified the fact that climate actions are essential for reducing the vulnerability of manufacturing, housing, health, as well as agriculture sector. And also that uh, uh, the Climate Change Action Plan will generate large opportunities for boosting the productivity and development of priority sectors and support achievement of universal health coverage for all Kenyans. Uh, another key outcome or rather result that came from this interesting assessment was that climate change adaptation and mitigation action uh, directly address or provide likely benefits for all the SDGs. So you can see that um, if you address climate change the impact uh, or rather the results will be felt across all the, the 17 SDGs. Uh, finally, uh, looking at ecosystem-based solutions such as climate smart agriculture, rangeland restoration and agroforestry, and the development of clean public uh, transport uh, yielded, showed a win-win uh, benefit for boosting employment and, ma and ma manufacturing capacity, as well as protecting environment and narrowing inequalities. So from this study, and uh, this is an assessment by the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, and of course it was multi-stakeholder involving, uh, including the Council of Governors. Uh, it's evident that you cannot separate uh, the Paris Agreement from, from, the, from the SDGs. Uh, to summarize, uh, maybe I'll just look at some of the challenges. Uh, of course, all these uh, nice stories have not just come without uh, some challenges. Some of the challenges uh, that we've experienced and some of which have been mentioned by earlier presenters. One is the, 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 the striking a balance, striking the balance between economic development and environmental sustainability. Uh, has been a, 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 in, in, the, in the face of poverty. 
uh, in Kenya are, is one of the challenges that we are experiencing because uh, uh, people will advance uh, economic development uh, some in some instance at the expense of the environment. And uh, the, this aggravates or results into, I mean, climate change and uh, some other negative impacts. And then, of course, uh, uh, in Kenya, we've been emphasizing on looking at the SDGs wholesomely and uh, not uh, cherry picking. And uh, Mr. Diambo will agree with me because we note that all the SDGs and are interrelated. So our approach has been to uh, emphasize the need for implementing, uh, uh, I mean, uh, laying emphasis on all the goals. Um, Final uh, challenge, uh, of course, has been the aspect of cascading uh, the national uh, structures and policies to the county level. As I mentioned earlier, the counties are just seven years old and these national uh, policies and frameworks are supposed to be cascaded to the county level because uh, some of those sectors are devolved and counties have the responsibilities or delivery of those sectors. So. Uh, with those remarks, uh, I thank you and welcome uh, any further question. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, very interesting to have this county level perspective as well of how how devolution really impacts policy coherence and how you have these county climate change funds and county level NDCs and it's almost serves as a pilot project for other countries who want to have a more decentralized approach. So I think, yes, yeah, as, as time passes, I think we'll have more learnings from that as well. Um, We'll now go straight into the Q&A session. We still have um, just over 20 minutes, 25 minutes for Q&A. Um, so I encourage you all to submit your questions. One question that we have from Nicholas Watts is, have you come to any initial conclusions about which instruments and approaches work best to achieve policy integration, both vertically across levels of governance and horizontally across sectors. So this is specifically about the instruments for policy integration. Um, and I will ask maybe Gabriela to reflect on that first. Uh, we cannot hear you, Gabriela. You might be on mute. Yeah, sorry. Um, I was saying that different countries have different approaches and of course uh, it also depends on, as I was saying earlier, it's state capacity which is very important and to what extent countries can um, address this issue. Um, I would say it is very important uh, since these topics as we have seen today uh, are, are so overarching and have such huge impacts, um, it is important to have um, a leadership at the very high level but then ensuring um, of course that um, there, are, there are discussions um, with uh, the state levels, the regions, and then that all actors are involved. And we've seen the, the case of Germany, for instance, um, we, uh, where they have on the one hand these advisory councils um, where all sorts of stakeholders, um, relevant stakeholders are involved, but they also have a parliamentary level um, body you know, and uh, there they can also do some further assessment and also um, ensuring um, a coherence um, and of course having all the ministries involved uh, that's important and the states um, but I guess it would also be different for different countries and the, their own structure and state capacity in that sense sure Thank you, Gabriella. Um, I don't see any further questions at the moment, so I suppose I will kick off a discussion myself and hope that you all could also ask each other questions and promote to the discussion. I think my first one would be for, for Ken and Stephen, who both you know, uh, emphasize this idea that climate does have benefits for other SDGs through mitigation and adaptation, and this idea of, of generating co-benefits. Um, and I would say that if on, theory and in paper these benefits exist, then why isn't it being implemented on the ground? So what are really the challenges to actually realize some of these co-benefits on the ground? Um, yeah, Stephen, if you would like to start with some thoughts on that. Uh, uh, this is a very technical question and I think Gabriela was trying to help us that some of these things, I think from the conceptual level, 
Yes, climate does have benefits for the SDGs. And from our SDGs integration, this is what we have been telling people. But in terms of the practical aspects of this, and as Gabriela raised some of these challenges, uh, start when now it comes to implementation, the actual implement. And what Ken also said, that uh, the problem is that uh, we have very good ideas, but sometimes it's very difficult also to have the capacities within even the government themselves to, to implement. This is what we have been preaching under our SDGs uh, development agenda, but it is very difficult to pinpoint. But in reality, if you look at the SDGs, if we don't address these issues of the, the particularly the, the trade-offs, then it will be a challenge. Oh yeah, what Ken raised was, how do you achieve all these nice things in the context of poverty? And of course, what Gabriela was saying is that if you don't have appropriate tools and instruments to be able to translate this into reality, then at the end of the day, we don't see them. And for us, one of the advisory bodies that helps us for the SDGs agenda is the UNDP, and they were trying to work with us, but I don't think we have finalized on this, and Ken can pick from what I have said. Ken, can you say something? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Steve. Uh, uh, I agree with Steve, but of course uh, I must say that uh, uh, we we have to start somewhere, and that's why uh, first is uh, very importantly to build uh, local coordination structures and uh, strong institutions at the local level for government, so that some of these good ideas can be rolled out. And that's why in Kenya we have strengthened the county coordination mechanism through uh, having designated county uh, uh, climate change units. So these county climate change units are therefore to uh, roll out initiatives that will um, uh, build community resilience to climate change. So, for example, now we are having an, an initiative on um, building locally led climate uh, actions uh, by strengthening uh, community capacities and uh, uh, building their, their, I mean, some of these initiatives from the local level. And we believe uh, this is what uh, will uh, help in the long run when the, 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 the actions of the local communities and the communities are empowered uh, to act responsibly and also to hold government accountable uh, for their actions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken and Stephen. We have a question from Henry Gandhi to Gabriella, um, which is that are there any strategies to deal with stranded assets, especially in South Africa? Um, yeah, that's a very important question. Uh, that's often an issue. I am not sure uh, exactly in South Africa, but I know there, there's literature on uh, different approaches of how to deal with stranded assets. And um, yeah, some of the countries, and again, this is also about affordability, so some of the countries may afford to simply uh, pay the, the power producers, uh, coal power producers, to the commission, the, the power plants, um, uh, it can be also that um, uh, countries might decide to buy uh, coal if they are not um, state owned, so and then they don't burn it anymore. Um, but I think most importantly, what should be done about stranded assets is that states would very early on signal that this is a risk. Uh, and in that sense, um, to on the one hand, if possible, completely interdict uh, building uh, such um, high risk uh, new infrastructure like uh, power plants, coal power plants. Uh, but also um, another thing that they could do would be to um, make it compulsory to include that into financial risks. So so again, sending uh, these very clear signals. Thanks, Gabriela. Um, we have a question, which is, how is Kenya arbitrating trade-offs related to SDG implementation? Um, I can ask Philip maybe to reflect a little bit on that. Uh, 
I, I did not get the question clearly. Um, I think the question is essentially on how Kenya is really dealing with these trade-offs related to SDG implementation going forward. Ken, can you try that while I organize myself? Uh, Philip, Philip, you go first. I had your name. <laughs> but go I was ahead, <laughs> Yes, yes. I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just give an example that I talked about, um, <clears throat> which is on energy security. And uh, of course, when um, when I gave the presentation, and can emphasize that um, Kenya, in the current development planning cycle, which is 2018-2022, there is a big four agenda, and one of those bigger four agenda is on manufacturing. Now, manufacturing has also relation strong relation with industrial development i mean to meet industrial development you need uh, a certain level of energy availability to be able to run the industry and this is one of the areas where we're seeing a, a potential conflict is between because on the one hand if you don't have enough um, energy uh, to be able to run your industry to run your transport sector and so on you can't you can't industrialize but on the, on the other hand we have set the Kenya, the country has set a target to reduce um, by 30 percent uh, emissions to 2030 as part of the NDCs. So clearly what is happening is that you've seen in order to, to deal with this trade-off is that the country is still relying on fuel-based uh, electricity generation, but you're seeing over time a shift to investment in renewable energy and at the moment, Kenya is actually one of the Africa's top leading um, producer of geothermal energy. Um, and the share of um, renewable energy in the total national grid uh, at the moment is actually above 50%. Uh, and this has just happened in the last 15 years. So we see a very big shift uh, from using fuel-based um, energy power generation into a kind of more green-based power generation. So that is one way of dealing with the trade-off. Of course, it is not overnight. Um, and of course, it has also to be at a level which can be able to meet uh, the energy requirements. And I think one of the things that's not being discussed, which came out from our study, is the fact that if you depend on, on wind, for example, or solar, these are very unstable sources of power. You cannot continuously rely on them because you need a stable base load to be able to maintain your um, energy level. So you can invest a lot in, on, on, on wind power generation, a lot on solar power generation, but you still have to maintain a steady base power, which of course has to come from um, either hydropower or in this case also, we do have uh, from independent power producers who, who, who sort of still use diesel based generators. So in periods of drought, because a big share of Kenya's energy mix is hydropower, every time there's a drought, that, that energy generation is affected. And so Kenya still has to rely on uh, ensuring energy security by depending on these independent power producers who still, of course, rely on diesel, diesel generation of power. So I, I guess that probably answers uh, that question, but maybe Ken can add from, from his perspective as well. Yes, I, I think I agree with uh, Philip. Uh, that is one of the uh, approaches that have been uh, employed by the government to, to deal with the trade-offs. Uh, but of course, we've seen also uh, areas where there has been uh, conflicts uh, or rather possible trade-offs uh, between, uh, between uh, energy and, uh, uh, and agriculture. Uh, but uh, largely, most of it has been uh, uh, dealt through uh, building incentives and legislation uh, but legislation has not proved to be uh, very sustainable and i think alternative building alternative uh, livelihoods uh, for communities uh, uh, has been one of the uh, uh, frame approaches that have been adopted and uh, as well as in uh, uh, adopting uh, favorable uh, uh, tax tax regimes yes thank you thank you yeah i just wanted to come mm -hmm. yeah just briefly and can rest it 
that for productive sectors like agriculture, of course, which if you look at that uh, synergy and uh, trade-offs, there are problems there, but now under the climate smart agriculture, we are incorporating the issues of climate change together with the agricultural practices so that we minimize issues of trade-offs. Uh, so in a, such a productive sector, I think this is how we are trying to do it. But going forward, I think we, as we said at the beginning, we must look at the issues of climate change together with the rest of the other sectors uh, for what I call the co-benefit. Because if we don't do that, then at the end of the day, if we look at the synergies and the trade-offs and do nothing, then we shall be integrating poverty. <laughs> and so for Kenya, I think we are trying to do that. But I also wrote a, a point to say that uh, some of the things that are holding us back is that we have a clear institutional framework, but the trying to actualize that framework to be able to work takes time. So there's always time lag and these things affect uh, major benefit, realization of benefits. The ideas are very good, as Zoha said on paper, but it takes time. And the government, we always they take too long to implement important things. <laughs> we, are, we are the ones to blame. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in line with that, I think another question here is that it was mentioned that barriers to policy coherence are political in nature. So how is the Kenyan government working to implement policies regarding um, the Paris Agreement and the SDGs, given this political nature and maybe political barriers existing? Maybe if I could go, uh, I could go first. Uh, in Kenya, uh, particularly regarding the SDGs, uh, uh, we have not had a major challenge in terms of implementation at the political level because uh, you'll note that the Kenya Vision 2030 uh, clearly uh, aligns to SDGs. Uh, and so when we mapped it against the SDGs, we found that it's, it, 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 it maps out because the Vision 30, uh, the Kenya Vision 2030 uh, has uh, three pillars looking at economic, uh, uh, political and environment. So this clearly aligned to the SDGs and, and the Vision 2030 uh, implementation started in 2007. So by the time the SDGs were coming into 2016, 15, 16, already we had made some strides and because the pillars uh, upon which SDGs are, uh, are mapped out and, and the Vision 2030 were uh, well aligned and then there's the buy-in at the highest level uh, that is the president. However, of course, there are uh, some challenges in terms of coordination, as, 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 as Mr. Diambo had alluded, but not really uh, regarding uh, the political buy-in. So the buy-in is there politically and uh, uh, notwithstanding other challenges, coordination. Thank you. I may just come in briefly. Uh, just to help Ken, I think in Kenya we embrace what we call sector-wide approaches to development, whereby these sectors that uh, are closely linked, we try to do interministerial inter kind of committees to advise on how issues should be handled. And normally that helps us to deal with the issues of political buy-in. But naturally, politicians do not have a lot of data and information and at the end of the day, rely on us, the technocrats. Uh, politics is about interest, but for us, we are talking about the hard issues of economic development. So at the end of the day, I think they come back to us again and we listen. But the politicians, normally they want short-lived, quick wins. But some of these things, when you give them the hardcore stuff about these issues, and if you adopt what you call the sector-wide approach to development, they tend to listen. Thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate your honesty on the topic as well. Um, a final question here from Carol Mungo, which is, um, has the global pandemic presented opportunities for reviewing means of curbing inequalities related to SDGs and Paris Agreement goals? Um, 
I will, will try to reflect a little bit on this just by saying that the pandemic definitely has shed light on a lot of these structural inequalities and shown how they're very systemic in nature. Um, while certain proportions of the population are much more vulnerable and these vulnerabilities and inequalities will be repeated in the climate crisis as well. And those very same people are more vulnerable to the climate crisis um, at the same time. And I think that definitely highlights the need for having solutions that aren't just focused on climate once again, right? So the existence of socialized healthcare, for example, can be a solution that relates to climate change as well, because it would help reduce those root causes of vulnerability to begin with. Um, but I will give an opportunity for anyone else who wants to reflect on that. Please go ahead. Uh, I could say maybe very quickly, Zoha, you also brought it to our attention. And um, in my presentation, I talked more about climate mitigation, which is also my topic. But I also wanted to emphasize um, that climate adaptation brings a lot of value to uh, the SDGs. And in that sense, um, part of climate adaptation is may also making our health systems more resilient. And making our health systems more resilient then would also support us in uh, in uh, situations like climate, uh, sorry, like pandemics, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, it's the same also because the, the pandemic also emphasizes this link between countries um, and also making our supply, food supply chains and uh, just supplies in general more resilient um, could uh, help. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um, I think another issue that has been quite interesting for me is this idea of debt relief being offered to developing countries from developed countries in light of the pandemic and those suffering from the pandemic. And I think very similar strategies can be offered when in within the climate crisis, for example, debt relief to address loss and damage when an extreme weather event occurs, um, which again is a means of curbing inequalities in a lot of these countries. So yeah, I think I think there's been a whole host of articles and webinars talking about the parallels between these two crises, but I think the key here is that these inequalities are not there by mistake, right? They're designed and structured and man-made, man um, which means that solutions to them do exist and tackling the climate crisis therefore also needs to consider these inequalities um, as well. So I will leave it there. Does anyone have any final remarks uh, they would like to make? Yeah, I just wanted to react to the question that you are discussing. And one of the benefits of this COVID-19 is that, uh, first of all, it has exposed what I always call the disjointed economic spaces that we have. So it has also alerted us that we had forgotten some of the important sectors like health, like in the developing countries. And one of the benefits is that moving forward post-COVID, then we shall need to address the key sectors like agriculture, like health, and give them the prominence they require. So moving forward, some of the shortfalls we have seen out of the COVID pandemic, I think it will help us reprioritize the issues that we need to move forward as countries. Although it has been a major problem, but it has also helped us to see how naked we are in the face of uh, a global pandemic in terms of socioeconomic development. Thank you, uh, Steve. Maybe I could also uh, uh, come in. I think it uh, it goes without saying that uh, the, the pandemic has heightened uh, inequality and uh, really uh, affected uh, economic uh, uh, development activities. If I will speak for county governments in Kenya, for example, uh, because we've seen counties uh, uh, reallocate the budgets initially uh, allocated for development, economic development, to address uh, the pandemic. But then again, uh, it has also given us an opportunity to realize some of the potential. Uh, like in Kenya, we've seen the reemergence of the private sector, uh, product producing some of the required PPEs and and some of the medical commodities. So that will be an opportunity that uh, we've, uh, we've, I mean, I'll, I'll mention. But then also uh, there is need to build back better. Uh, 
from the pandemic. And that's why uh, are the, the county governments of Kenya, coordinated by the Council of Governors, uh, is currently developing the county socioeconomic reengineering and recovery strategy that will take us beyond the COVID. Uh, and I think it, it's an opportunity that even as we develop finalize this strategy, then we, we take cognizance of the fact of, of the other aspects of climate change uh, that might be forgotten even as we, we want to recover the losses that we've achieved during this period. So I think we should not keep our eyes off the ball that building back better might be also uh, impact on climate change as we seek to recover quickly from the climate, uh, from the impacts of the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we have reached the end um, of our time allotted for this session. So thank you very much to all of our presenters. Thank you for everyone who attended. Um, and ask such interesting um, and insightful questions as well. I hope you guys benefited and enjoyed the discussion. Um, this webinar will be recorded and published online and we can also share the slides afterwards. So feel free to follow up with any of us if you have any further questions and thank you very much again. How do we get out? Bye bye. <laughs>